Not well, so uh, mine's not a whole lot better, but we'll go for it anyway, because I have a good loud voice. Uh, Sharon Giles, we're excited to have her here today. She is the director for the human, uh, the human resources director at uh, Utah State University Research Foundation, which we call USURF on campus. And um, she will share her insights for nearly 30 years in the business of human resources. Uh, perhaps some lessons you won't find in a textbook, which is what we would really love to hear. Uh, Sharon completed her undergraduate work at the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, and went on to earn an MBA in 2010. As the leader of USURF's HR function, Sharon serves as a, comp uh, as a confidential sounding board and advisor for the USURF president and other leaders and employees. As is true in other organizations, USURF's HR team is responsible for a cadre of processes such as, and these you might know, some of you will be familiar with, affirmative action, equal opportunity, equal, e equal uh, employment, employee relations, comp and benefits, staffing, corporate events, um, uh, leadership and employee uh, uh, development and succession planning. Um, in, addition, uh, in addition, security, safety, and corporate events report to human resources over at USERF. Uh, prior to joining USERF, uh, Sharon was a director of uh, human resources at ATK, and um, her initial assignment with ATK was leading the group's Talent Management Center of Excellence. Uh, the first 20 years of Sharon's career were spent at various uh, Kimberly, Car Cl Kimberly Clark Corporation locations. That was a tongue twister. Yeah. That was tricky. <laughs> Sorry about that. A significant highlight during the Kimberly Clark years was providing business mapping support internationally. So thank you again, Sharon, for My coming. Pleasure. We're delighted to have you here, and I'm going to turn the time to her. So good afternoon. Am I legal to kind of sit like this? Is that fair game, guys? Okay, so question for you. How many of you are human resources is kind of your major right now? That helps me. Okay, so doesn't matter, but if I get a little HR speak on you and you don't know what I'm talking about, those of you that aren't, just shout and I'll kind of clarify that. So when I got the call from Lynn to do this today, I thought, what in the world, what possibly could I have to share that these guys haven't read in a textbook or learned somewhere along the way? And I guess when you get to be my ripe old age and you start to get reflective, which can happen, and I'm not sure if that happens because my children have moved on and they're in college and I have more quality time by myself to do that, or if it's just this natural evolution in life. But one of the things that I kind of landed on for today is there's just things that when I do the look back and I think about lessons I've learned along the way that have helped me either personally, professionally, or both, that's the kind of stuff that I thought, I want to tell these guys because I want to share it because I think it's little nuggets that you might walk away with one sentence or one phrase. And if that helps you, hot dog, I'd be tickled. Uh, so by way of introduction, I guess it's not cool to block the board, is it? Um, here's events that have shaped my life. So if you look at the 20s, 30s, 40s, like all of you guys, you go through those things. So in your 20s, what are you doing? You're having your buddies, you're at college, you're going to graduate, you're getting married, and you're thinking about your career and what you want to do. And at that point in my career, I was with Kimberly Clark. And I was with Kimberly Clark, like Jamie mentioned, for really over 25 years. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that journey. As you move into your 30s, it's all about your family. You've got sporting events. You see snowmobiles there because our two boys did what we call snowcross race. So if you think of motocross, these guys were on snowmobiles, you know, doing all these sort of flips and spins. At work, I did a lot of training during that time. And I kind of like that clip art, so I threw it in there because I, I did a lot of stuff that I... Um, you do more now than you realize that that helped you to be able to stand in front of people and not completely lose hope that you can't stand in front of folks. As you moved into your, as I moved into my 40s, and you're kind of reevaluating things along the way, what do you want to do? There were three pivotal things that happened during that time. One is we relocated. So we actually moved the, I'll tell you the story really quick in a nutshell, is I was with Kimberly Clark at a place called Ballard Medical, which was in Draper, and the plant was basically the medical work that we did was being outsourced to Mexico. So I had a decision. I'd been with Kimberly Clark over 20 years at the time. 
do I move with Kimberly Clark or do I stay in Utah and try and find a job? I'd always wanted to go to the Mecca, which was the co corporate headquarters of Kimberly Clark, and I had an opportunity to transfer. Mind you, I have a spouse who's very happy in his job locally, two boys in high school. Not the most optimum time to make those life upsetting decisions, but we did, and we relocated to Wisconsin. Got there for a year and a half and for all kinds of reasons. The job that I had, I liked it, but I didn't love it, and I'd always loved my job. Having a husband who was gone one week, every other week, back to Utah to do his job wasn't exactly the coolest family situation. And two boys who were welcomed with open arms in Wisconsin, but missed the mountains, missed the sports, missed the friends. It was one of those, well, if I get a chance, I'm going to get my butt back to Utah, which fortunately I was able to do and join ATK. Also during that time, when I came back, it was like, there's goals. I have a bucket list. What am I going to do about it? So I decided I had to run a marathon. I'd been talking about it for years. All talk, blah, blah, got to make it happen. So I did Disney World. If you ever have the urge to go do anything like that, the friend that I did it with, she said, if we're going to do this, Sharon, we got to go to the happiest place on earth. And she was right. You're trudging along. You're at mile 18, and you think you're going to die, and Mickey's cheering you on. Doesn't get much better, does it? Um, and then the other big hitter is I felt like it was time for me to do my MBA. So here I am. I'd been out of academia for a while, and I thought, oh, I'm watching jobs, and I'm thinking about my future. And I thought I have always felt bothered by the fact I had an undergraduate degree, but I didn't have that view and that perspective that a master's program and the business side would bring. So I went back to school, rolled up my sleeves, and said, I'm going to do this again, and I'm going to try it. And I was kind of an old duffer, but it was, it was wonderful. So as you look ahead then, oops, and say, what lies ahead? I mean, there, there is so much life yet for me. Um, as I moved into my 50s, as Jamie mentioned, I joined Utah State University Research Foundation. And I'll talk about that transition. There were some great questions at lunch. One of the things that probably your parents tell you is they have more quality time together now. So you see the, the husband and wife there on a ladder. That has been a transition because we, everything revolved around the kids. You're always talking to your kids. You're going to your kids' activities. And suddenly it's like, well, wow, we're going to spend all this quality time together. We can, we can redo the house. We can go on these cool trips. It's really quite fun. It's kind of like dating all over again. And then snowshoeing. I decided, courtesy of my children this winter, to take up snowshoeing. And it has just been a joy to find some other way to enjoy winter. Certainly in my 50s, hopefully I'll be sitting in the audience as my boys graduate. And that's fun. I mean, I'll just tell you, your parents will be proud as peacocks when you're doing that. As I look ahead to the 60s, there's a tablet up there because technology, I have made a pledge to myself. I am never going to stop learning. I'm going to make sure that from a technology standpoint, I take advantage of it. I had to put the gray-haired people enjoying vacation because at some point I'll quit dyeing my hair and I'll have gray hair too and by golly we'll be enjoying these little trips and then hopefully we'll have grandkids and hopefully we'll be looking to our retirement years. I used to always, always tell my husband, I want to live to be 100. I just want to live. Now as I've seen more people who are 100, quality of life does factor in, right? But I want to do the things that make sure if I'm able to live to be 100, that I'm adding value, that I'm healthy, that I'm doing the things you see listed here, enjoying time with my family, debt-free, hopefully still out hanging with my husband, doing fun stuff. So anyway, by way of introduction, that's probably more Sharon Giles stuff than you cared to hear, but it sets the stage for now my next segue for you, which is as you think about the lessons and the coaches that surround you every day, I feel really blessed when I look back in my lifetime and I think certain people have come in in my life and while they may not be in my life today, they have left a mark on me or they've left a print that it's my chance now to sort of share that with you in a quick snapshot fa fashion, not the same way I had the luxury of that over years and years, but just some things to think about. So I consider these people my informal life coaches, and you guys all have tons of them yourselves. And it wouldn't be right if I didn't start with mom and dad, right? So my dad. So my dad was an HR guy. Oh, fancy that. Here I am, following his footsteps. But dad has always, always, you've heard in real estate, they say location, location, location. Well, my dad has said performance, performance, performance. And he said, whether you're in a group in school, whether you're on a church project, whether you're involved in your community or on the job, what can you control? You. You can control, you can't control how anybody else behaves, but you can make sure that you are doing your job 
in the fashion that you were expected to do it. And he's also been a staunch advocate of providing specifics, whether it's me during my annual review saying to my boss, these are the things that I did, or it's me as a leader providing specific feedback either in an annual review or along the way to be able to say not, oh, Jamie, you did a great job, to be able to say, Jamie, when you led that meeting, you had people eating out of your hand. They were watching you. They were listening to you. Um, let's see, who else can I pick on? Was it Ryan? There was a Ryan somewhere. I lost my Ryan. Ryan, 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 when you led that project, you came in under budget. You got that thing done with a minimal amount of disruption to the workplace. So as you think about your own careers and you think about things that you can make a difference, give specifics like that. Don't just assume that your boss can spend all his or her waking days knowing what you're doing. Help them understand that. But your, what your performance is all about. And when you become a boss, give that kind of feedback. And I don't care if you're a boss when you're 50 or you're a boss when you're 20 on a community service project. Let folks know what they're doing right because that way when they're doing something wrong, they're hearing a balanced amount of feedback from you, right? How that's played out is I'll tell you, I had to giggle. At age 40, when I mailed my dad my performance review, I thought there comes a point in your life when you probably quit reporting to daddy how you're doing, right? But it has always been fun to say, dad, you made a difference. Here's how I've learned from you about the importance of performance. So there's one for you, right? Performance, performance, performance. At any time, I would love it if you guys ask me questions. So please don't be shy. It will make it so much more fun. Okay. Got to have mom in there, right? So mom's the softer side. So mom, while well, dad is saying, do your job, Sharon, perform, 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 I watch mom, and I watch how she listens. And anybody she comes in touch with, they're the most important person in the world right there. So how has that affected me on my job? When somebody comes into my office and my phone rings, I'm not answering it. If you ever come in, you'll notice I won't because that phone is not nearly as important as those two eyes staring at me. And the other thing is she has always, always made sure that people know they care. Now, mom's the famous one of little tokens of appreciation. So she gives the little gift that says just because or she's the one that calls on a birthday to say just thinking of you, honey. But in the workplace, appreciation goes a long ways. Um, I had to reflect on mom when we just did we did an employee satisfaction survey in December of 2011. And one of the things that happened as a result of that is we formed a focus group on recognition. Because our employees were saying, you do a pretty good job, but we think you can do even better. And as that small group started to meet and talk about things, they said, you know what we really, really want? is we want a culture of gratitude. We just want a culture that people are really forthcoming with saying, you helped me today. Thank you. That made a difference. You, when you do you know, these certain things, it really helps. So here's my next aha for you. Culture of gratitude goes down the chain of command and up the chain of command. Don't forget to tell your boss that he or she is doing a good job. I watch my president, Doug Lemon, and the leader of our lab, Neil Holt, spend tireless amount of time to make our lab and our place a great place for people to work. They travel, they make personal sacrifice, they're faced with difficult decisions that there's no way to please everybody. Don't forget to tell the people like that in your lives, in your career, thank you, because they're working hard too. And don't forget to tell the, the security person that greets you when you walk in, or the administrative assistant, or the custodian that empties your trash. It just kind of breeds the spirit of gratitude in these things that, it's just a kind place to be. And I'll, I'll back up and say, um, I came to Utah State University Research Foundation in January of 20, I get my years so mixed up, 2011. And it really does embody a lot of culture of gratitude. So it's not like there was this huge opportunity to do things different. But it was just a wonderful reminder that no matter how big or small the company is, make sure you're letting folks know thank you. Let's look at some bosses. So by rough count, I've had over a dozen bosses throughout my career. You work for lots of people informally, right? Lots think that they're your boss. You probably know that already. So Avis was a boss that um, came to me at Kimberly Clark. So I was probably in my 20s or so. And Avis left me with really four big lessons, which three of them come into this notion of respect others' time. Avis taught a course called Participatory Leadership. And 
I feel like that was one of those classes I went to 30 years ago and I still feel honored that I went to the class. There were three lessons in that class. One was desired outcomes. So if you're having a meeting, what do you hope to accomplish? The second one is have an agenda. And the third one is who makes the decision? So first one, the desired outcome. If you're going to have a meeting, and again, I don't care if it's a school meeting, a community meeting, a work meeting, what is it that you want to leave there with? We want to leave with a plan for. We want to leave with a decision about what do you want to leave there? What is the tangible walk away from that meeting? Having an agenda. Nobody likes surprises, right? Time is so blasted valuable that if you put a dollar figure to everybody's time in that setting and think about what they could be doing, you go, wow, there's meetings that I've sat in and I've looked around the room and I thought, this is thousands of dollars. I hope we're making good use of time because literally the company just paid $5,000 and I don't know what we got for it. So kind of that helps put things in perspective a little bit. The agenda. The agenda helps avoid surprises. It helps make people know what they should be ready for. So if it says, here's what Bill needs to be ready for, here's what Sarah's going to present, there's some accountability, takes the load off you, you don't have to do it all, right? Involves others. Every book you read will tell you involve other people to make sure they're doing it. And then at the end of it, on any decent agenda, there's always a section that talks about action planning. So there's when you leave, who will do what by when. And I'll tell you what, I don't know about you, but how many meetings do you leave? And everybody kind of goes, yeah, 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 and off you go. And you think, now who's doing that? And they, oh, I thought you were doing it. No, oh, I thought you were doing it. it. Again, that's one of those little things that you guys may have this in spades. Maybe I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But it is a big deal, and I do not see it done well universally. I mentioned Avis taught me four things. The fourth thing she taught me, and I'm going to sound a little bit antiquated, Avis had a job aids book, and when she joined us at the Kimberly Clark Ogden plant, she kept an alphabetized binder, and anytime something came up and she wasn't familiar with it, so say, for example, how do I, um, in Kimberly Clark's way, how do I handle a request for funeral leave? How do I, in Kimberly Clark's culture, handle when an employee has been asked to go ju do jury duty? Some policy, some not so much. But she would just keep a quick note. Now, you guys would probably all do this electronically. I'm still old. I have a binder. But it has helped me because in my job, which I've been on almost two years now, there are things that Utah Retirement System, how do I deal with Utah Retirement System? It happens once a year. I do not have that much gray matter to remember how to do all these things. So having a job binder that I can go back to and say, I don't have to go back and say, my predecessor, Melanie, Melanie, tell me one more time, how do I do this? That is a complete waste of her time. So being, again, back to being respectful of people's time, make sure you're taking responsibility so you don't have to quit asking people how to, right? Any questions so far? Nobody's sleeping. I'm feeling real proud about that. Okay, Margo. So Margo was and still is one of my very best friends at Kimberly Clark. That so Margo and I had kids together and you know did the whole different life cycle things together. And one day I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but she was like, "Sharon, your sphere is out of control." And I went, "What?" She goes, "Your sphere isn't balanced." I'm thinking, what is Margo talking about? And she goes, Sharon, in life, think of your life as one big pie. And she goes, your pie has two pieces, work and kids. And she goes, you're losing you. You're, you're, using, you're losing fitness. You're losing spiritual. You're losing the balance that all of us need to make a difference. And that's kind of on the personal side, you guys. But it has been a lesson that I'll think, oops, I'm out of control. Life is what it is, right? Sometimes one slice of the pie gets bigger or smaller, depending on what's going on. But you will all be in this beautiful places in your lives where you'll be getting married if you're not already. You'll have children. You've got lots of demands for your time. Don't lose you. Take the time for you. I, male, female, it just doesn't matter. Just make sure that you keep, some, keep your sphere balanced, right? Keep your pie whole. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, so anyway, I, and friends, take time for friends because the experiences that you have, you, oops, sorry, the experiences that you have with that, you, you are a richer person for the give back that you have along the way, okay? There's my tip for you there. So Diane, 
Diane was the last boss that I had at the Kimberly Clark Ogden plant. Why was she my last boss? Because Diane pushed the baby bird out of the nest is why Diane was my last bird at Kimberly Clark Ogden. When I got there, Diane sized it up and thought, huh, I have a staff member here who's been here about 15 years. She's been through every HR job. She's very comfortable. What can we do to shake it up a little bit? Um, I had done safety. I had done benefits. I'd done employee relations and training. And little did I know, I was bored. I loved the people there. The culture was incredible. The business was wonderful. But it really wasn't challenging me anymore. So methodically, I, don't, I think it was very contrived, but Diane made sure I, she pushed the baby bird out of the nest. She made sure I was, when she was on vacation, I was in charge. I was the HR manager. When there were opportunities to present to, to, present to senior leaders, Diane tugged me in. When there was projects that had a lot on the skin in the game, Diane had me do those sorts of things. Uh, she even went so far as to round out my narrow HR focus. We had a job there called a shift superintendent. Kimberly Clark makes all kinds of products. The place that I was at makes diapers, Huggies diapers. So we had diaper machines, and that functions around the clock. Nine different, at that point in time, nine different diaper machines, and there was a role called a shift superintendent. The shift superintendent was basically the person in charge at any one given shift that's monitoring schedules, monitoring production. If there's a quality issue, if there's a maintenance issue, the buck stops with the shift superintendent. Shift superintendents occasionally went on vacation or got sick, and you had to have a backup. Diane said, Sharon, you need to be a backup. It's going to teach you a broader perspective of the business. You're going to understand kind of the day-to-day. You'll be even a more effective HR contributor. You'll have this lovely opportunity to work shifts. Yay! (laughs) So those experiences, the opportunity to be around the clock and hear from employees, really did help my perspective. So when you get in your job, here's my look back thing. Understand what your customers, day in a life, shadow with them. What are the employees? Don't just hang out with the layer right below you. Go all the way. What what do they do all day long? How do their roles contribute? Don't be shy when you get in your new job about understanding how they all fit together. How does this department work with this department? What do they need from HR? What don't they need from HR? What problems have they encountered? What have been the biggest successes? So get out of your shell, this is kind of the get out of your comfort zone, and then talk to the people that you're going to be working with. Probably the biggest claim to fame about getting out of your comfort zone is Diane helped me leave Kimberly Clark Ogden plant. So again, you know, here I am, got kids, thinking I'm happy. Diane says, Sharon, there's this opportunity in Draper. So Draper was about, what, an hour, 15 minutes south of where I lived. They need an HR manager. This HR manager role, Sharon, is going to interact under the same roof. You'll have manufacturing like you you know today. In addition, they'll have sales and marketing and customer service. So you're going to have everybody under one roof in this way that you've never been able to see how all these things thread together. And oh, by the way, the director of HR probably won't be there forever. So at some point, you'll go there as the manager over the production port. But when he leaves, it could be that you're going to be over all of this and be the director that has sales marketing, needs to deal with sales commissions and things you haven't done before. I was so scared and I thought, oh, I can't do that. I could never be good enough and and it's scary and oh gosh, what about the commute? And my dad, another thing he and mom taught me was whenever they were encountered a, a a transfer situation, he would make this list, real simple list, a line and a thing across the top, pros and cons, in your values down one side of the paper. So what are the things that matter? Well, am I going to make money? Do I have a good boss? What about my commute? What about the advancement opportunity? Stay in Ogden, go to Draper. So I did that sheet when I was had the opportunity to go to Draper. And when I did it, I had all those points calculated, right? And my husband sits down and he goes, Sharon, you have made it fit what you wanted to the answer to be. He goes, you gave high points to your current boss, Diane, because you love Diane. You gave no points to Joe. You don't know Joe. You sabotaged it. You rigged it. He goes, go back. And it was like, oh. You know, so you go back and do it again, and I thought, I'm just scared. That's all there is to it. But the, the happy ending to the story is I went, 
And I really believe that that opportunity, coming in touch with those people, seeing the world through different eyes, was a gift not only to me, it was a gift to the plant that I left because it was time for them to have some new and fresh blood too. They needed somebody new in my job. So now let's talk about Ballard Medical. So Ballard Medical, as I mentioned, was in Draper. Ballard Medical was acquired by Kimberly Clark a little less than a year before I got there. So Kimberly Clark came in, looked and said, from our portfolio mix, we think having this medical device manufacturer, so trait care and um, what else, feeding tubes, that was the business, very different than high rate of speed manufacturing equipment. Our, at the Ogden plant that I came from with Kimberly Clark, we were probably about 75% male, average age was probably 30. When I went to Ballard, we were about 90% women, average age was probably 50. Light manufacturing, most of the workforce were women that came back into the workforce after a spouse had a medical issue, and it was work that they didn't have a lot of skills, but they could sit on a manufacturing line and put little tiny parts together and get the insurance that they needed and have the check that they needed. So just demographically, it was a very different mix than what I was used to. It was also pretty hostile when I got there. Kimberly Clark came in well intending, saying, we're this big company, we've got 56,000 employees, we know how to do this. This was a little mom and pop, homegrown business, very successful. But Kimberly Clark workforce that came in, came in with a bit of a, we're gonna show you how to do things. And that was abrasive to the culture because there were things they didn't get that successful without being pretty sharp about what they did themselves. But there were some practices that they did that were probably not legal. They were probably no longer acceptable. So let me give you an example. They had poker games in the, in the oh. urban legends are that the, they would have, you know, it wasn't uncommon maybe on a Friday afternoon to tip back a couple cocktails and have a little poker game with the leadership team. Things that in today's world, there is no way in the world. The, the chairman or the, the head of the company, there was a guy with really, really long hair. And another one of the urban legends was, don't like your hair. So if we meet X safety record or you do X thing, can I cut your hair? So they pull him into the cafeteria, everybody gathers and he cuts his hair. I mean, they're just things that my little rigid Kimberly Clark world, we'd never allow those sorts of things. But there were charming, those aren't necessarily the charming ones, charming pieces of their culture. But the life lesson there was learn and respect those differences. If As, as today's um, employment, changes and you start thinking about the workforce and mergers and acquisitions and coming into different companies, never assume that you're all wise and all knowing. Learn from the folks that are already there. Help them if there's other ways to do it. But, you know, a couple questions. What's working? What's not? <laughs> Pretty simple, right? And they'll tell you. And over time, there's going to be a blending of cultures, and there was with ours, but just really stepping back and taking the time to learn from their cultures and learning how each individual there, there was a lady named Juanita. I remember Juanita, just you could tell anybody that even, Kimberly Clark, she, you walked in the door and you had the Kimberly Clark you know, insignia. She didn't like you. And by the time I left, we were friends. That was a victory, right? You just think it's the little things. So anyway, let me pause again. Any questions so far? Still nobody dozing, so I'm feeling real proud. Okay, so as I'm at Kimberly Clark, I'm at Ballard Medical, lo and behold, we're gonna outsource. Oh, so the plant's gonna close and we're gonna outsource everything to Mexico. Wow, nobody taught me that in school, right? How do you do this? How do you go through all this sorts of thing? Um, so. One th thing was just respecting people with dignity. And that lesson, I didn't put up here, but it carried through even at ATK. As you go through turbulent times and people do need to lose their jobs, if you're in that spot, which I have to believe all of you HR professionals at some point in your life will be faced with that, don't ever lose sight that they're human beings and don't ever lose sight that people want to be respected and treated with dignity. So as you have to let people go, one of the things we did that fit the culture beautifully at Ballard Medical, they basically had an autograph goodbye cake party. So we had, and remember our average age was 50, mostly women. They came in and we said, we're just gonna have a farewell send off. We're gonna have some cakes and, and we wrote on their best wishes. This was the group that we had first wave of people leaving. 
unbeknownst to us, they had purchased, you know like when you go to Disneyland and you have the little autograph book and Minnie will stamp it and put her little thing and sign it? They brought books like that and they had people writing almost like a yearbook and putting in their phone numbers and their contact information and they hugged and they cried and, and they said goodbye. But it allowed them to go through this cycle in such a very humane, lovely way that it was something so simple, cost, didn't cost but a dime, but it, it showed that respect and dignity for those folks that were, were leaving. So I got a little ahead of myself. Um, so as the plant was closing, here we go. It's another decision making, right? So I'm there and it's A, I can stay with Kimberly Clark and transfer out somewhere out of Utah now. Ooh, now I'm really nervous, right? Now I have to think about leaving Utah. Or I can stay and find something locally. Or I can certainly ride out the plant closure, which had about another six to eight months ahead of it. So how that story unfolds is I thought, I have always wanted to be at corporate. I've always wanted to live in Wisconsin. That's where my mom and dad live. Oh, my kids can be by mom and dad, and they can see how it is to have grandma and, this grandma and grandpa close by. So after much soul searching and, and just angst, complete angst over doing that, my husband and I made the decision, and we transferred to Nina, Wisconsin. <clears throat> my job there was called Business Support Delivery Organizational Change Consultant. It was kind of trendy at the time and kind of unknown, right? It was like, okay, sounds real good. What am I going to do? But it was Kimberly Clark had lots of locations. In fact, they're 56,000 worldwide. They had a lot of legacy systems. But what that meant is when they wanted to report data, it was very difficult to get all this data in one place that they could report quickly, efficiently, and accurately. So this business support delivery project was saying we're going to take all these legacy systems and have one enterprise resource planning system that's going to lead up so we can have all these results. But what that means, you saw in the little thing that Jamie said, it talked about business mapping, that we needed as HR persons to map materials processes, map maintenance process, and know how all these disparate parts fit together and then be able to speak to that. So again, it was another thing to get myself um, deeper ingrained into the business. So needless to say, when I got into this job, I thought, change management. I don't know a lot about change management. This lovely person, Michael, another one of my life coaches, uh, had read you, some name drops, authors. John Cotter does a lot of stuff on managing change. If you have any appetite for that, read John Cotter. William Bridges is another one that talks about transitions and change, managing through difficult times. Another fabulous author. Michael was my life coach. Michael got in and he was masterful at saying, all right, let me think about this meeting or this event. And he'd, he'd talk about, okay, let's think about the stakeholders, Sharon. Let's know the audience. So he'd kind of tuck me up under his wing and he'd say, Okay, let's think about who's going to be in there. Hmm. Oh, it's going to be Lauren. What does Lauren think of this project on a scale from one to five? One being really lousy or five being really good. Well, Lauren, it's a one. Hmm. Where do we want Lauren to be? Well, we want Lauren to be a five. We want him to embrace this project and think it's awesome. Where do we think we're going to get him to? We'll be lucky if we can get him to a two or a three, right? Who's going to get him there? So he, you know, Michael would just ask all these wise questions, and then we'd think through, ah, we really need Tom to help him get there. So we would think through strategically, who do we need to influence this person and to help share information? And it wasn't always us, but we planned ahead to know what things behind the scenes it was going to take to have it be successful. You, I am sure in your coursework have heard the term stakeholder management. The power of it is amazing. To this day, I hope you use it in your own personal lives outside of school, but I'll also tell you, I don't go into a meeting without thinking through who's going to be in there, what do I need them to be, where, where do I think they're at, because it helps me plan, again, to make a good use of their time and also to know what things might they not have perspective on that I have to help share that. You will also see very masterful people in their jobs that when a decision is to be made, all the work for that decision probably took place two weeks ago because they've worked all the participants to know what, where they need them to be. So when it comes time to raise or vote or do anything like that, they've done all the stakeholder management. They've, they've thought about it ahead of time. So there's that one. Ian. So this is one of those, oh, if I knew then what I knew now. When I went to Wisconsin, the leader of my project there was Ian, lovely man from London, 
zero tolerance for in, uh, incompetency. And I felt like I had the big eye. <laughs> it was horrible. E I had been spoiled, we talked about this at lunch, by a company where we had experts for many, many things. If I needed a PowerPoint made, I could scratch it out on a tablet, give it to this crackerjack administrative assistant, and she could turn it into a work of art. If I needed a spreadsheet, I could conceptually say this is what I need and turn it over to somebody. So when I got to Wisconsin in this new role, I felt literally like a dinosaur. I felt like an antiquated T-Rex. I don't know if that's a T-Rex. I always get them screwed up. But I got in there and thought, oh my goodness gracious, I don't have some fundamental basic skills that Ian is expecting me to have. And there's times I just wanted to just burrow down and go, oh, I'll never be successful. But the pledge I made to myself is, A, you're humbled really fast, right? So you figure out how to get good, and you swallow your pride, and you say, I need to learn. And you seek out people, and I'll tell you the other lesson is, I never once encountered somebody that said, oh no, I'm not going to teach you that, Sharon. Oh no, I won't help you learn that. Don't ever be so proud or so silly that you don't reach out to others to help you if, if you don't understand something. Um, you, know, you don't want to embarrass yourself, certainly, but it, it is a pledge that I have continued to make that I won't ever go into a job and be a dinosaur again. I'm going to make sure technologically I'm looking at trends inside and outside of HR, and I'm prepared for it. Now we're at ATK. So you're on my lifeline. You're just kind of plodding along with my lifeline. So when, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, when you're with Kimberly Clark and all is well, you go across the nation, and it was kind of cool to live in Wisconsin, but from a family perspective, it wasn't optimum to be split up like that. I yearned to get back to Utah. I missed the mountains. I missed the lifestyle. I missed everything about thing. I, I was very sad to leave my folks, but again, it was, it was cool to come here. So I was fortunate enough, and, and this is the power of networking, had a friend who I had worked with, with at Kimberly Clark. She knew I wanted to get back. She had left and gone to ATK, and she said, Giles, ATK is hiring. It's a talent manager. It's right up your alley. And I thought, oh. So got to come back to ATK as the manager of the first. They were kind of standing up this unit. When I say talent management, do you guys, is that a term that's meaningful? I'm seeing nods. Anybody not know? Talent management is a buzz, it's, it's kind of the new word for human resources. Talent management says if you look at your equipment as your assets, you look at your people as your capital assets and your human, what are you doing to manage this group? What are you doing to make sure you grow, develop, nurture, do succession planning? So how are you managing your talent, basically? Um, so anyway, got to ATK. Big company, so ATK is 18,000 people. We have a staff of 30 people in HR, huge. Again, we're a lot of specialty people there. And we'd get into meetings. Mind you, this is a lot of very smart aerospace engineers, technical people, degreed crazy. Um, easy to get pretty intimidated in that setting. The director of our engineering staff, I'd love it. We'd sit in meetings, and there'd be this, what, what do we do? What do you, and this no-nonsense leader would go, whoa, whoa, whoa. What problem are we trying to solve? If you remember one thing from today from me, remember that phrase, because you will save yourself and others a lot of time. Dave used that freely. And oftentimes, we were trying to solve about 12 problems, and everybody was there with their agenda and what they wanted to get solved. But Dave was masterful in terms of saying, okay, first, we can all agree on this one that we're trying to solve. And then you'd start to think through, there's other things we want to address as well. But for right now, this is the one problem what we're trying to solve and get us to that common ground. Second to last slide here. So ATK... I did the talent management thing, and then I was able to then move into an HR director role. So our team at this point had dwindled down. I think we were about 15, so we'd halved. We're, we were half of what I was, or what we were when I started there. It, you, if you're from this area, you followed the news to know ATK had a lot of reductions in force. I mean, once we quit flying the the rockets and stuff just don't have as much market for that. But there were so many lovely, good people there, and our human resources team was pooped. Um, 
you can only handle so much reduction in forces and the, the uncertainty of yourself, the uncertainty of the workforce. It was hard to be in HR at that time. And there were times that I think the group struggled with what, what can I control, what can I do? And we had kind of this brainstorm. And you see a book up here listed, The Orange Revolution, and there's a predecessor to that. It's The Carrot Principle, I think is the name of it. And it talks about how you reward and how you take responsibility and different things in the workforce. Good, you guys know that one. So we had this brainchild, and we said, well, let's read this book. Let's read this book as a team. And then everybody was assigned a chapter. And the only rule was, okay, Dave, you're chapter one, no PowerPoint. You need to teach us about your chapter, but no PowerPoint. Do whatever you like. And so each person, it worked out like it was just heaven sent because it, it was, I think, 11 chapters and 11 people, and it was just cool, and we had prizes and so forth. But the creativity that came back was off the charts. This one really, really dry-witted guy, Mike, he taped himself. That's why the tape up there. He did a fireside chat. We laughed till we thought our sides were going to split. Here's Mike, very somber, in front of a fireplace, and he's teaching his chapter. And it was so clever. You see a Santa hat. Kayleen, it was Christmas time when we did this, wrote a children's story and came and sat like we were her kindergarten audience, put this hat on and talked us through her chapter. It was so simple but so cute. Somebody else came in and they had a game show. And so we were all up moving, dancing, doing all these things. Somebody else took a scroll. I thought, I haven't thought about scrolls since probably seventh grade and studying Mesopotamia, but they, they had a scroll. And literally they used a scroll to do this. I sat there and thought, I totally underestimated the creativity of this group. And just seeing how they did that, one, taught me to never underestimate the creativity of others, but two, I rather like that no PowerPoint approach, and I rather like having people read a book because not everybody was real tickled when I gave the book assignment. But by golly, when they read it, they were really engaged. And we've done that since. In my current job, we've done a book and done a similar thing, and it was equally fun and exciting to, to have something a little bit different than a book club, right, to talk through. Okay. Oh, I lied. It's my, this is my second to last slide. Um, so my husband. My husband has this uncanny ability. I can have my hair on fire and be spurling around in a thousand directions. Sharon, it's no big deal, he'll say. And so find that rock in your life that will say to you, when your hair's on fire and you think the fact that you haven't figured something out, will look at you and say, you got it. It's no big deal. It's lovely to have that perspective, and it's lovely to have that rock. And most of the time, he's right. It all works out. It's fine. Plan ahead. Go back to the other. Go back to step one. Performance, 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 right? There's all these lessons in how they build upon one another. But take time to breathe. Um, that's the other lesson I'd share is when we were going through this horrible plant closure at Ballard, we brought in an out, outplacement provider. And the lady said, I'm going to tell you the most important thing right now. Don't forget to breathe. And she said, when you have these things going on around you, I don't care you know, whether it's an outsourcing or something like this, watch where your shoulders are. When they're up here, think about it. Take a deep breath, and you will be amazed when you lower your shoulders and take a breath, deep breath, the stress of that final, that project, that idiot that you work with, all those sorts of things start to take a different tone when you remember to breathe. So there's another one for you. Now, my drum roll, please. Yes? What does your husband do? He is, okay, he works for Union Pacific Railroad, and he's what they call an ARSA. An ARSA is a fancy name for a man, he's not a manager, he's right below a manager, between a foreman and a manager. So he travels around on the railroad and is responsible for the Great Salt Lake and the causeway. I'm kind of biased, I'm kind of proud of him. Um, so here I am. So as I mentioned when I opened this, I'm at this place in my life where I can no longer look up at everybody and I can still look at so many people I admire and learn from, but I also have to remember now it's my turn. It's my turn to pay back and it's my turn to think about how do I make sure I'm developing Corey in my office for my job or Sharon in my office for my job, whether it's my job in our place or my job somewhere else. How, you remember the old pay it forward movie? It's the pay it forward time. And it's, 
I will back up and say, I think that pay it forward time, whether you're 20, 30, or 40, or 50, you're always in pay it forward mode, right? You can always be helping others learn and grow. But the guy, this is the only real photo in the whole thing. The guy you see listed on the right is Doug Lemon. He's the president of the foundation. He's my boss. Doug does the most amazing job of thinking about his mark and his legacy. And Doug has, he has thought through who will be the next, who will succeed him next, who five years from now, and who 10 years from now. And he's doing things quietly behind the scenes. And those folks may be within or outside of our current place. But what are the things that he can do to help ready them for that opportunity? And he thinks broadly. When Doug came in, he looked at what he thought were opportunities to make a difference at the foundation. And he sequentially said, and I talk about it as his, his wall, as he said, these are the bricks I need first. Here's the things that I need to do. I need some rigor and discipline in place differently than it is today. Then he layered on and said, once that's established and firmly entrenched, then I need to think about my leadership development. And once that's in place, I need to think about it, and so on and so on. So Doug methodically has orchestrated his career with the foundation to say, where can I add value? And when, I, when people look back 30 years from now, what are they going to remember Doug Lemon for? And, and the fact that he spends time on that, the fact that he, it's in his you know, current, it's not just something out there, he's, it's imminent for him. The fact that he's caring about where we're going to be in 10 years when he's out on a golf course is really inspirational to me to say, I need to start thinking about those things. So what mark do I want to leave at USURF? What, what difference can I make today and what difference can I make in 10 or 15 years to the, to the workforce that's there? So with that, those are my random life lessons, and uh, I would love to have questions and hear from you guys. Yes? In terms of like, your work-life balance, do you have any suggestions to us? Like, I recently got married, and I'm thinking about starting a family. So just like, do you have suggestions on that? <laughs> Don't learn from me. <laughs> um, <coughs> yes. Um, back to that sphere to keep it balanced. You will, you know that notion of a one-man band where they're always kicking themselves in the hiney. If you try to be the consummate wife, mother, professional, you'll you'll make yourself crazy. You will need help at home. You need to make sure that you and your spouse are sharing things differently than maybe your mom or your grandma did. I'm older. I thought that the only way to be a really good mom was to do everything like my mom did, which was completely unreasonable. Um, make sure with work that you, you always, like you know, my dad, performance, performance. You need to do your job, but there's also time when other people can step up and help too, and you can go broader than that. And, and have, I guess this sounds very mother-like, but just always keep that open communication with your spouse to know that when things, you know, how things are going, that you too are working through those things together. Jamie, would you answer that any differently? You've got such insight as well. Um, no, I, I think um, I, I did things a little differently than you, but um, no, I, I would agree that, that that's a good way to do it. I wanted to ask you, I was at a women in tech lunch last week, and we had a panel of women um, working in the tech world, and they talked about something called the imposter syndrome. And I guess in the tech world, they sometimes feel like the women are, or and and the men feel it as well. That that you know they're just sort of they're they're in this role, but they're kind of an imposter, and they they don't really know what they're doing, or people think that they don't know what they're doing. And I just wondered if you ever encountered that, and I haven't heard of it in the HR world no. either. No. So I just wondered if that I thought that was kind of interesting that they brought that up. That is interesting. I have not heard that. That's yeah, that, I have. That means, that means we're in a we're in a better place. Yeah, <laughs> I should say. Yeah, you you guys have been with me for all of like forty minutes now. I mean, I tend to see the world through pretty rose colored glass. I, I, like it or not, I was blessed with some pretty serious optimism that this what you see is what you get with me. That's who I am, and um, I have this knack of when things are crappy. Usually, I don't remember them nearly as well as when things go well. Sometimes that can be a real big pain in the butt because it's not always fun to be around me, but. I, after this long, I kind of know that's who I am. <laughs> yes. Say, who you replace over 
uh, you surf, isn't it, Melanie? Yes. And she kind of, that's why she left, wasn't it, was to kind of balance that. Family. Yes. Okay. Oh, and I'll tell you, that's who you ought to ask. I, Melanie Pond was my predecessor at you surf. Just an amazingly talented, she is my friend. I mean, she is so much more than my predecessor that I can't even begin to tell you. And she made probably one of the most difficult decisions I think you could possibly make, which she traded, a, traded. she temporarily left her career, which she was and is very, very successful and focused on raising her kids. And uh, she's the one that's the master because that's the ultimate thing to me, to be able to say, I can take a little time away. We're lucky because Melanie still helps out a little bit on some projects and just is an amazing HR professional. Did she? Yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah, that's good. I'm glad you brought that up. She's. Yes, Steve. So, Sharon, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> okay. To, what currently is keeping me up at night is the situation with the federal government. So with the federal government right now and continuing resolution and sequestration, what that means for us is contracts and work that we have been able to count on and know that we have jobs for everybody. And this is not leave go tell the Herald Journal that we're going through all these things. But it is real worrisome to me because the work that we do we don't have the same assurance that we used to have that it will be there. And there was a reason I left ATK. I didn't want to be in that world with that lack of assurance. So that is a worry. The other, for a, I always will worry incessantly that I'm not doing enough. And we, um, in terms of leadership development and employee development, we, we've been working on some things relative to that. And it keeps me up at night to know that we invested a lot of money and a lot of time, and I don't know if we've necessarily done everything we can and should do to get the return on investment for those individuals and for the organization. And then the usual stuff like, how am I going to do this or that at home? Did I see, did your hand go up as well or no? Okay. I am happy on a personal basis. I know I've been in your shoes before and sometimes there's questions that aren't as comfortable in a larger setting. If you have questions that are better suited privately, um, I can leave some business cards or you can work through Jamie. I'd be most happy at any point to field questions for you guys. I mean, there, this isn't rocket scientist, science. You, you guys probably know a lot of this as well. They're just some little tips that help me. Someday, 40 years from now, you'll be standing up here giving it from your own tips of things that you learned. I think that might be it. Thank you, sir. Let's give her a round of applause.